Hi everyone, my name is Judy Chang and I will be your host for this episode of A Minder. Today we will be covering part 1 of 2 on amyloid or tau protein detection in the brain. These papers were all published in August 2020 and include a variety of methods for targeting these proteins. I'll be going over 12 papers in total in this episode, and all of them involve positron emission tomography in one way or another, which I'll be referring to as PET. As always, feel free to refer to the original papers in our bibliography if any of the summaries are of interest to you. Welcome to Aminder, a podcast where we summarize the latest publications on Alzheimer's disease for you, so you can spend more time doing awesome research. For every month, you'll find a series of episodes by theme, and each comes with a bibliography. Whether you're in the lab, on the bus, or cooking your meal, we hope you find this podcast useful and accessible. Let's go ahead and get started. Our first five papers use the Pittsburgh Compound B tracer to image beta amyloid plaques in brain tissue. I'll be referring to this as PIB. The first paper is titled, Postmortem Analyses of PIB and Flutametamol in Diffuse and Cord Amyloid Beta Plaques in Alzheimer's Disease. The first author is Ikonomovich, and the last author is Farrar. This paper is found in the journal Acta Neuropathologica. This study addresses the limitations of existing imaging to autopsy validation methods of amyloid PET radioligands. Several false positive cases have been identified for high amyloid PET signals in the striatum, where diffuse plaques predominate in Alzheimer's disease. To correct for this, the authors used 3H flutametamol and PIB for an in vitro binding assay and autoradiography. Samples included 30 autopsy cases from sporadic AD and non-AD controls. The researchers processed tissue sections of the frontal cortex and caudate using fluorescent derivatives of cyanoflutametamol and PIB. Epifluorescence and confocal microscopy were then used to measure volume of cord and diffuse plaques. They found that cyanoflutametamol labeled plaques correlated strongly with cyanopib labeled and A-beta immunoreactive plaques. To summarize, PET signal of flutametamol and PIB is likely correlated to plaque size and density of A-beta fibrils in plaques. This next paper also looks at spatial relationships between amyloid beta and neurodegeneration. It's titled, Spatial Relationships Between Molecular Pathology and Neurodegeneration in the Alzheimer's Disease Continuum. The first author is Yaricino, and the last author is Rabinovici. This paper is found in the journal Cerebral Cortex. In this study, the researchers tested 81 amyloid-positive patients with AD dementia or mild cognitive impairment and 31 amyloid-positive cognitively normal participants. They obtained PET images with PIB, 18-flortausapir, and 18-F-fluorodeoxyglucose, as well as 3T MRI scans. Voxel-wise deviation maps were created and binarized for each imaging modality, adjusting for age, sex, and total intracranial volume using amyloid-negative cognitively normal adults. Pathological amyloid beta was the most common pathology seen in asymptomatic and symptomatic patients. This was shown by having the greatest proportion of cortical gray matter suprathreshold voxels. Molecular pathology, such as levels of amyloid and tau, showed a progressive overlap along the course of AD, suggesting for potential shared toxic mechanisms. Check out the paper in the bibliography for more information on their results. Paper number three is titled, Alzheimer's Disease Pathology in a Community-Based Sample of Older Adults Without Dementia, the MYHAT Neuroimaging Study. The first author is Sullivan, and the last author is Snitz. The study is found in the journal Brain Imaging and Behavior. The study uses data from a sample of 102 cognitively impaired older participants. All subjects completed a PET scan using the tracers PIB and F18AV1451 to estimate amyloid and tau deposition. 39 participants tested positive for PIB, 
as defined using standardized uptake value ratios. Health history, lifestyle, and cognitive abilities were also assessed. The authors found that PIB-positive participants tended to be older, less educated, and more likely to be APOE4 carriers as compared to PIB-negative participants. These findings suggest that while brain, amyloid, and tau are common in a community-based setting, they show few associations with cognitive performance in a dementia-free sample. This next study also uses standardized uptake value ratios, which I'll be referring to as SUV ratios. If you're not familiar with SUV ratios, they are calculated as the ratio of tissue radioactivity concentration compared to the administered dose of the radioactive tracer per weight of the participant. Put another way, they measure the radioactivity in a particular region of interest and then divide this by the radioactivity of the whole body to get a ratio. In the case of measuring amyloid, higher SUV ratios would mean higher levels of amyloid in that particular brain region. Next is the fourth paper, which is titled Regional Gray Matter Dedicated SUVR with 3D MRI Detects Positive Amyloid Deposits in Equivocal Amyloid Pet Images. The study is found in the journal Annals of Nuclear Medicine with the first author Ishii and last author Kimura. As the title suggests, the authors developed a regional gray matter dedicated SUV ratio system for detecting amyloid deposits in pet images with 3D MRI. This method looked at amyloid positive regions through PIB and specifically targeted cases where detection of amyloid was a bit ambiguous. They found that specificity, accuracy, and both positive and negative predictive values were higher using the new system as compared to conventional mean cortical methods. The authors concluded that this method succeeded in discriminating between amyloid positive and negative subjects, even in cases where amyloid deposition was equivocal. Our last PIB paper, and paper number five of the episode, is called Sensitivity Specificity of Tau and A-beta Pet in Frontotemporal Lobar Degeneration. The first author is Durelli, and last author, Whitwell. The study is found in the journal Annals of Neurology. The study used Flirtasapir PET to examine tau and amyloid beta in 24 patients that had died with frontotemporal lobar degeneration. 10 of the patients had progressive supranuclear palsy, and another 10 had corticobasal degeneration. The authors performed BRAC staging, A-beta plaque, and neurofibrillary tangle counts, as well as semi-quantitative tau lesion scores. The authors found that flortausapir uptake patterns differed in the two mentioned groups. They also discovered correlations with tau and amyloid beta pathology, but molecular PET lacked sensitivity to detect mild pathology in frontotemporal lobar degeneration. Before we move on to the next set of papers, we're just going to take a little break. Enjoy the transition music, and I will be back shortly. Hey listeners, I'm here to let you know Aminder is recruiting. If you're interested in joining us, shoot us an email at aminderpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Enjoy the rest of the episode. And I'm back, jumping right in. Our next two papers evaluate novel diagnostic methods of AD. Paper number six has a bit of a longer title. It's called Image Reconstruction Methods Affect Software-Aided Assessment of Pathologies of 18F Flutometamol and 18F FDG Brain Pet Examinations in Patients with Neurodegenerative Diseases. It's found in the journal Neuroimage Clinical with the first author Lindstrom and last author Lubberink. The authors wanted to know how new developments in pet image reconstruction affect software-aided assessment of pathology in patients with neurodegenerative diseases. Groups included prodromal Alzheimer's disease patients and controls receiving 18F flutometamol and neurodegenerative disease patients and controls receiving 18F FDG PET scans. Images were processed through various expectation maximization methods, including time of flight and point spread function measured and SUV ratios were also computed. 
the methods get pretty complicated, but basically the authors found that these processing methods either increased or decreased the relative uptake difference compared to the control subject's data within the software, depending on the tracer and chosen reference area. Normalizing to PONS for 18F flutametamol and whole brain for 18F FDG increased differences between reconstruction methods compared to normalizing to cerebellar gray matter and whole cerebellum. The authors concluded that software-aided assessment of patient pathologies should be used with caution when employing image reconstruction methods other than those used for acquisition of the normal database. You can take a look at the original paper for more details. The next study is a little bit different and it evaluates a novel second generation PET tracer. The paper is titled Diagnostic Performance of RO948F18 Tau PET in the Differentiation of Alzheimer's Disease from Other Neurodegenerative Disorders. The first author is Luzi and last author Hansen. It's found in the journal, Journal of the American Medical Association. To reiterate, the novel Tau PET Tracer is called 18FRO948, and I will be referring to it as RO for simplicity. Participants included patients with mild cognitive impairment, AD dementia, and non-AD neurodegenerative disorders, as well as cognitively unimpaired controls. RO was compared to MRI and cerebrospinal fluid measures, as well as flortausapir F18. BRAC staging for tau pathology was used to determine SUV ratios in predefined regions of interest. They discovered that retention of RO was higher in AD dementia compared to all other diagnostic groups. The authors also found a lower temporal uptake of RO as compared to 18F flortausapir. Elevated RO SUV ratios were mostly seen in A beta positive cases suggesting that this tracer has high specificity for AD type tau and could act as a diagnostic marker in the differential diagnosis of AD. Next up, we have two papers that look into cognitive decline in older adults. Paper number eight is called Increased Variability in Reaction Time is Associated with Amyloid Beta Pathology at Age 70. It's found in the journal Alzheimer's and Dementia, Amsterdam, Netherlands and it's by first author Liu and last author Crutch. The authors looked at whether neuroimaging biomarkers of AD pathology predict performance in a two-choice reaction time task. Subjects were older adults aged 69 to 71 and completed amyloid beta PET as well as MRI. They found that amyloid beta positive participants had 10% more variable reaction times than amyloid beta-negative participants, and both groups had similar mean reaction times. This provides evidence that amyloid beta pathology is associated with poorer consistency of reaction time in older adults at an age when dementia prevalence is still low. The ninth paper also uses older adults as subjects and looks into sex differences of tau distribution. It has the title Sex Mediates Relationships Between Regional Tau Pathology and Cognitive Decline. The first author is Buckley and last author Sperling. It's found in the journal Annals of Neurology. The authors recruited patients with MCI and healthy controls from the Harvard Aging Brain Study as well as the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative. They examined 18F flortausapir PET across 41 cortical and subcortical regions of interest. Linear regression models revealed that females showed significantly higher FTP signal than males across multiple regions of the cortical mantle. The authors also found that APOE4 moderated sex differences in FTP signal existed only in the lateral occipital lobe. Linear mixed models showed that females with higher FTP signal in composite regions of interest exhibited faster cognitive decline than males. In conclusion, sex differences in A-beta and tau concentration were not limited to the temporal lobe. Accelerated tau proliferation found in females may account for sex differences in cognitive trajectories. We're nearing the end of the episode, and our last three papers don't really have too much of an overlap so I'm just going to go over each of them separately. 
Paper number 10 is the only one in this episode that uses an AD mouse model. This paper was actually presented in our June series, and a correction has been made to the original paper. The title is Hybrid Pet MRI Enables High Spatial Resolution Quantitative Imaging of Amyloid Plaques in an Alzheimer's Disease Mouse Model. The first author is Frost, last author Lee, and it's found in the journal Scientific Reports. I'll just go over the study really quickly and explain what's different about the updated version. The authors aimed to increase spatial resolution of PET imaging for monitoring AD pathology in a mouse model. To do so, they combined PET and MRI imaging by adding a PET insert to a small animal MRI instrument. Using this hybrid imaging method, they found that uptake of 18F florbetapyr was elevated in the cortex and hippocampus, as well as in the thalamus. These findings remain the same in the corrected version, and the new changes actually only concern the figures. I think there might have been some duplication of samples across figures in the original paper, so check out the updated version in the bibliography for their corrected figures. You can also check out our June 2020 episode on amyloid and tau detection in the brain, hosted by Ellen, to hear more about this study and other interesting studies on this topic from the month of June. Paper number 11 is an interesting case study that looks into amyloid deposition as a precursor for primary cerebral angiopathy. It's titled 18F Florbetapyr PET in Primary Cerebral Amyloidoma. It's by first author Sofers and last author Krolls, and it can be found in the journal Clinical Nuclear Medicine. In this study, the researchers looked into the case of a 54-year-old woman where MRI revealed an ill-defined mass in the periventricular white matter. The f florbeta pier pet ct imaging fusion technique was used to support the pathological diagnosis of AL-lambda amyloidoma. This method may be useful in the diagnostic workup of patients suspected to have cerebral amyloidoma. The authors suggest this would be especially useful in cases where biopsy is not possible. And our final paper is called Correlation of Alzheimer's Disease Neuropathologic Staging with Amyloid and Tau Syntographic Imaging Biomarkers. It's found in the Journal of Nuclear Medicine with the first author Koichev and last author Friedman. The authors highlight that neuropathological changes of AD can begin 25 years prior to the onset of clinical symptomatology. This study looked into three elements that define postmortem AD neuropathological changes. The elements are spread of cerebral amyloid, neurofibrillary tangles composed of hyperphosphorylated tau proteins, and density of neuritic amyloid plaques in the neocortex. They found that amyloid beta without the presence of tau is confirmatory of biological AD. These biomarkers could become a new classification system for postmortem diagnosis of AD. Take a look at the paper in the bibliography for more details. And we have reached the end of the episode. Thank you for listening in on part one of amyloid and tau-based detection in the brain. Again, feel free to use our bibliography if you are interested in any of the papers presented. You can receive access by signing up to our mailing list and the instructions are in the episode notes. As always, we are actively recruiting new members who are excited about science communication to join our team. No experience is required, just send us an email and we would love to meet with you. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, so check these out for our most recent updates. Huge thank you to Sarah and Nyla for sorting these papers, and to Anusha Kamesh for putting together the music pieces. She can be found on SoundCloud as Anusha Kamesh or on YouTube under AK Music. We hope you find this podcast useful and accessible, and we'll see you again soon.